maybe since you're older, it is time to redefine what sex is. Mm. So many people are stuck in this model that sex is intercourse and that's all sex is. And honestly, as we get older, women tend to want intercourse less. They enjoy Mm. other things that are sexually pleasurable that are connecting, even just cuddling, Mm. you know, is Mm -hmm. very pleasurable. It doesn't even have to include an orgasm. So Mm -hmm. the more that we broaden our definition of sex beyond intercourse into something that's pleasurable and is connecting, the happier we will be. Hi, I'm Biz Cush, a life coach and therapist and your host here on the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. We're talking to women all over the world who found their way back to themselves, to their inner knowing, to their intuition to their wisest self. We're exploring how to feel alive, authentic, engaged, and fully present in your life. Let's awaken your wise woman. Hi, and welcome back to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. I'm your host, Biz Cush, and I'm super excited about my conversation with Heather England that we'll get to in a minute. But I wanted to let you know that new groups for highly sensitive women are forming soon. And I have had the pleasure of working with seven amazing, highly sensitive women over the last three months. And it's just been a joy. It has brought me so much pleasure, I guess is the right word. I was trying to come up with the right word, pleasure and joy and connection to meet these beautiful women from all over the country as well as around the world. And I would love you to be a part of it if that's something that speaks to you. If you are a highly sensitive woman in midlife and are looking to connect with other women all around the world. It's a great space. So groups are forming. They will start in the new year, 2024. But you can sign up now. You can reach out to me to sign up now for a free 30-minute conversation to see if the group is a good fit for you. There's a little teaching from me, teaching and education. There's lots of group support and there's connection. We're getting to know each other. We're sharing our struggles and our successes and it's a beautiful space. So if this sounds like something that would support you in your life, you can reach out to me through my website, elizabethcushcoaching.com. At the very top of the page, there's a button that says, let's talk. And you can send me an email that says, I'm interested in the group or group interest or 30 minute call. And I will get back to you and find a time where we can talk and figure out if the group is right for you. And I hope you do. Well, on to the show and my conversation with Heather. She is a sex therapist and we are talking about good sex. And I know just based on conversations with clients and friends who are of similar age, that good sex in midlife isn't always easy. Whether we're misaligned with our partner's desires and needs, or our bodies are just changing and it's not quite what it used to be, sex that is. But Heather and I are exploring why it's important to continue to have good sex, even in midlife and beyond, and ways to help you do that. So here's a little bit more about Heather. Heather England is a licensed clinical psychotherapist, certified sex therapist, and life coach specializing in helping people love themselves and create the lives they truly want, nurture meaningful, 
loving relationships, and have great sex. She has had a wild and varied career that includes being an army officer and a senior manager at Hallmark Cards. Her focus as a certified sex therapist is helping people in midlife and beyond with the challenges like low desire, disconnection from their partners, shame, lack of sexual know-how and self-confidence, and erectile dysfunction so they can enjoy magnificent sex. Let's jump into this conversation with Heather. Hi, Heather. Welcome to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. Thanks. It's so fun to talk to a fellow podcaster, but also someone who I actually know and feel like I could call it sort of you a friend. So it's nice to have you on the podcast. And uh, I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself for the listeners who might not know you. Thanks, Biz. I'm so excited to be here today. Let's see. Wow. Well, I am a licensed clinical psychotherapist, and I'm also a certified sex therapist. The difference between a certified sex therapist and a sex therapist is those of us that are certified have done some really significant training and rigorous supervision to make sure that we're highly competent in what we do. I came to this career later in life. I was in the military before that, and then I was in corporate America. And really the common thread for me through all of those positions is I really wanted to help people be better versions of themselves. And that was my management style when I was a senior manager at Hallmark, and it's how I led my troops in the army. I just always wanted to help people to grow and change and create really meaningful lives. I had always wanted to be a therapist. And so this was a later in life dream for me to have the luxury to go back to school and become a therapist. And along the way, I just really fell in love with sex therapy. Hmm. That's so funny to, I mean, to say you fell in love with sex therapy because sex and love are often so interchangeable or so connected, I should say. I've watched uh, a couple of your videos and listened to your podcast and I love that you are so open and honest and willing to talk about sex in such an unencumbered way, because that isn't always the case for a lot of us. Right, right. I think that culturally, there's so much stigma talking about sex. I really want to have a t-shirt that says Great Sex Podcast, you know, my podcast name. And I'm thinking okay, who am I going to offend walking around with a shirt that's got the word sex on it? Yeah. And, or make a a t-shirt that says something like, we need to talk about sex, but who knows, I might get other people upset, but it's a shame. Or or you might get interactions that you might not necessarily yes. them. <laughs> exactly. especially being a woman. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. But it is important to normalize it and to be able to, especially in therapy, be able to talk about it because it's so important in our lives, right? I mean, especially in a partnership. Exactly. And sex is part of sexual health. And that is part of who we are as human beings. And so many people have experienced shame around sex growing up, and they're afraid to talk about it. It feels awkward. It feels uncomfortable. So oftentimes they just avoid it because that's the easiest thing to do. Not avoid sex, but avoid any real conversation about it or any exploration of their own sexuality. And they end up really missing out on what could be something very beautiful for both them and for their partner. Mm. Yeah. Well, I just think about the, yes, the shame that can be tied up in it, especially too, if there has been any type of trauma around sex or sexual trauma in particular, but I also know as a woman in midlife that my body changes that have happened because of menopause and where I am in my life have made sex more challenging. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how 
midlife might impact a sexual relationship, whether it's heterosexual or or not. Sure, sure. I would love to. Oh, my goodness, aging. It, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's so much packed into that, right? And yeah. as we age, our bodies change and we might have a harder time moving or being in certain positions. And we may have health issues too that affect what we're able to do. So sex looks different as we get older than it did when we were younger. We just don't oftentimes have that kind of physicality Mm -hmm. that we had with sex when we were younger. Mm -hmm. Another reason that sex can change as we get into midlife is oftentimes we can really disconnect with our partner over time if each of you is focused on different things that give you meaning. Say one is focused on career. I mean, both could be focused on career. But oftentimes, you know, mom is focused on the kids and you can get so busy. It doesn't mean you don't love each other, but you can get so busy with your life that you stop nurturing the friendship. You stop nurturing that real connection and that closeness that really is the pathway to sexual desire for women for the most part. You know, Mm -hmm. women need to feel really close and connected to their partner to be interested in having sex. So if you've disconnected from your partner and you haven't done date nights and done all those things you need to do where you've spent quality time with one another, sex can become you know much more difficult as you approach midlife. The other thing that happens is we go through menopause. Men tend to have lower testosterone levels. Things don't work as well as they used to. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, menopause yeah. can cause just a host of issues for women. We have lower estrogen. Our vaginal tissues are more fragile. They thin out. Sex can become very painful. Yeah. Things kind of shift and change and can atrophy. Your your vagina can actually atrophy if you don't have penetration for a while. And that can make pain even more significant yeah. for men they have erectile dysfunction. And even a normal healthy male is likely going to run into periods of erectile dysfunction or erectile dysfunction every time. And what that means is they just can't sustain an erection that's hard enough for penetration. And really erectile dysfunction goes with the decades. So about 50% of men in their 50s are going to have erectile dysfunction some or all the time, 60 in their 60s, 70% in their 70s, 80 in their 80s. So it's very prevalent, but we don't talk about it a lot. Again, that's Uh, another one of those aspects of sex. We just really don't talk about a lot. Well, that's what was that's what was sort of percolating in my brain as you were talking is that like these are such normal things that happen to our bodies as we age and yet we're not normalizing it mm-hmm. in the context of my life or your life or like everyday life that this is natural this happens and it doesn't mean your sex life has to be over, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's funny because I have this memory of being with a group of friends where the women were in one room and the men were in the other room. And it seemed like inevitably with this group, we would end up talking about sex and with our (laughs) partners. And I don't know if the men did, but definitely the women did. (laughs) And it was almost as if the consensus, which uh, I felt a little sad about, the, the consensus was like, I don't want it anymore as a woman. I know I have to do it because they want it. And it's like my obligation or job. This is part of my role as a, as a wife versus like, I enjoy connecting physically with my partner and I love the intimacy and yeah, we, maybe we don't do it as often as we did, but this is bonding for us, you know, which is Mm -hmm. how it has evolved for my husband and I, which is, Mm -hmm been nice. Yeah. 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 Do you hear that often in your line of work? Oh, yes, completely. And 
And typically that brings up several thoughts for me when I hear someone say that. So the first thought I typically have is maybe since you're older, it is time to redefine what sex is. Mm. So many people are stuck in this model that sex is intercourse and that's all sex is. And honestly, as we get older, women tend to want intercourse less. They enjoy Mm -hmm. other things that are sexually pleasurable that are connecting, even just cuddling, Mm -hmm. you know, is Mm -hmm. very pleasurable. It doesn't even have to include an orgasm. So Mm -hmm. the more that we broaden our definition of sex beyond intercourse into something that's pleasurable and is connecting, the happier we will be. Research actually shows that the most satisfied and happiest couples as they are aging have Mm -hmm. redefined sex into Mm -hmm. pleasure and connection and away from intercourse because so many things can go wrong with intercourse. You think about all the steps that have to go right in order to have intercourse. Mm, And we can set ourselves up for failure, not just ED, Uh, but pain. Yeah, There's just a lot of things that can go wrong along the way. So the more we can move away from that as our goal, our expectation of what sex is, the happier we will be. So that's one thing I I try to share with people when they say that they really don't want to have sex anymore. Another Mm -hmm. thing I typically will say to them is, well, what kind of sex do you want to have? Because when somebody doesn't want to have sex anymore, oftentimes the kind of sex they're having is not enjoyable sex for them, Mm -hmm. but they don't say anything about it because they think it's their obligation. That was that word you said, right? right? They feel obligated. And when we have sex, when we don't want to have sex because we're obligated, how does that make us feel? Well, do you look forward to the next time you're having sex? No. Right, right. It's like you feel objectified. Yeah. Yes, you feel objectified. So you kind of then start to dread sex. So when you start having sex when you don't want to, when you say yes, when you really want to say no, because you feel like, well, I kind of have to, it's been two weeks, he's pouting, then Mm. what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for actual, actually for lower desire levels. Because the more you dread sex, the more you don't want to have sex, the more you're going to, you're not going to desire it right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The more closed you are, right? Just emotionally, but too, I would imagine physically, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, because you're, in a way, you're violating your body by having right. sex when you don't want to. Right. You're, you're, you're giving consent when you really don't want to. Mm-hmm. And I have heard couples say, yeah, well, but it's not fair to him and he deserves to have an orgasm. And I say, does he have a hand? Okay. I mean, (laughs) there's also wonderful sex toys that you can use to have an orgasm when you're a male. You don't need your partner's vagina Mm. or mouth to have your orgasm. Yeah. Right. And then, and then I'll get pushback sometimes from, from the men. And I'm not trying to mail bash here. This is just some men saying, yeah, but it's just not the same. Mm. Right. Yeah. And then I push back on them and I say, but how do you want to treat your wife? Yeah. Do you want her to do something that really she doesn't want to do just because you want it? Are your needs in that moment more important than hers? Mm. Mm. But if we circle back to the question of what kind of sex are you having and is that sex good sex? Is that the kind of sex you want to have, right? Then oftentimes we can go through a process where we can explore what kind of sex would be good sex to you then, right? right? If really all you're having is 90 seconds of foreplay and you're going right to intercourse, then that's really not that enjoyable, okay? Because women take on average 20 to 40 minutes of direct 
clitoral stimulation in order to have an orgasm. Men, about three to five minutes of penile stimulation. So women need a lot longer time to warm up, okay, to get aroused. We say women are more like slow cookers and men are more like microwaves. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I love that. Well, yeah. and can I add too, if you're highly sensitive, it could take you even longer because you just need that depth of processing and, and connection and intimacy to really feel that closeness and relax enough to get aroused. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that would make that push you more on the mm-hmm. upper end of that spectrum, right? Yeah. 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 And I would think it's really important for your partner to understand that mm. and to be able to give you that space and that time, right? Yeah. And not rush you along. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, totally. Yeah. And so what if we were talking a little bit about this in terms of being on different paths sexually, right? Like, oh, you're either here it's my obligation or maybe as a woman or in the in the partnership, I do need more cuddling and foreplay and just time spent in other intimate ways. And your partner is really just about, let's just get to it and have intercourse. Like how do, I mean, it sounds like, you know, talking it through as we just did, but really getting them to sort of be more open to hearing the other side. Mm Mm-hmm. So what you're describing is a classic desire discrepancy. Um, Mm. That's what we call it. It's a differences in sexual desire in a relationship. And it strikes people all across the age span. Yeah. Not just as we get older, but, you know, I have many younger clients that are suffering from the same thing. Yeah. And typically it is the higher desire person that tends to think they're right. Hmm that tends to think the other person should be up in their game, right? (laughs) Right, (laughs) And meeting them where they are. And it's really important to understand that the differences are both in frequency and what you want to do. Okay, because one partner may want more sex than the other, but one partner may also want to have different kinds of sex than their partner. Yes. Like yes. one partner may want sex that is a little kinkier mm-hmm. than the other partner, right? So sure, there's sure. what we call right there is a desire difference. It's a desire discrepancy. Yeah. So when those situations arise, it's really important for the couple to really talk about sex, right? The thing that we started off the episode saying is really, really difficult for most people to do. Yeah, yeah. And I always say, well, you can tell your partner how to load the dishwasher. <laughs> how come yes. you can't tell them what to do sexually? But it's mm. just so filled with embarrassment and awkwardness and shame. It's really hard for people to talk about this, but they have to. They yeah. really have to be able to say, this is what I enjoy about our sex. This is what I don't enjoy about our sex. This is what I would like to have different about our sex. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, people really need to understand their own wants and needs sexually. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for people to unpack that. Sometimes they are a little disconnected Mm -hmm. from their body, whether it's because they've never had the space to explore their sexuality. They may have had sexual trauma. Yeah, They may have had a partner in the past that pressured them into things they didn't want to do. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. many, many people really don't take the time to explore and figure out what turns them on. What do yeah. they need? What makes sex great for them? Mm. So when we have a discrepancy in a couple, I often suggest they get curious and say, could you get curious about where your partner's coming from on this? Can Mm -hmm. you understand their perspective? Can you understand why this is important to them? Can you understand why they don't want to have as much sex in you or they want to have different sex in you? And if they can get curious, it can hopefully open a dialogue between the two that can be productive. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, in all right. of that. Yeah. Well, because from the curiosity is can it can create creativity or new ways of being with each other, I would imagine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a great segue into the next point, which is people have to learn to compromise. Yeah. It's it yes, doesn't yes. mean one partner's right and the other's wrong. There's a middle ground that they have to figure out for themselves. I think the the researchers, John and Julie Gottman, mm-hmm. um, who have done tons, tons of research about relationships, say that about 85%, I believe that's the number of issues in a relationship are actually unresolvable mm-hmm. because wow. we have different beliefs, different ideas, we're different people. So we don't mm. necessarily think alike. Mm. And for some people, sex is one of those unresolvable differences. They may never resolve it in a way that they're both exactly aligned with their with their desire. Mm. Okay. So mm. how do you manage something that's unresolvable? You figure out how you compromise. You figure out how do you work this out together as a team, as partners, so that each of you are satisfied, mm. right? Yeah. And part of this, Biz, is couples have to avoid the blame game, Yeah, right? Boy, Blaming boy, boy, one boy. another so hard. for- yep. Yeah, yeah. Not for falling the, into that. Yeah, you're, if you only, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it's unfortunate that the higher desire partner is going to hear no more frequently and if if they're not really confident or they see no as a rejection of them, if they yeah. don't feel desired, that can really hurt their self-esteem, right? Mm. It impacts their ego. So yeah. that is a conversation couples need to have too is, how do I say no that is not going to be upsetting to you? Right, that you can hear me and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Another conversation couples, especially those with a desire discrepancy, need to have is how do we initiate and who initiates? Well, and I would imagine too, like, what does consent look like and sound like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. Because consent is so important. And yeah. just as we talked earlier with women that feel obligated to have mm-hmm. sex with their partner, and it's not always women, sometimes it's men too, Sure, because it's even harder for men when they are the lower desire partner, Oh, because absolutely. from a societal standpoint, right? The expectation is you're going to be the driver of this. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. it's this toxic masculinity of what a real man is, right? right. A real man's supposed to want sex 24 seven. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So this is lovely. I mean, I love to think about the the possibilities for couples where there is a a desire discrepancy that compromise you may not always be getting exactly what you need, but if you're both giving and receiving, that's really beautiful, right? Right. Yeah, I think it's important for couples to understand what sex means to them too. Mm. As I mentioned, if one person is rejected, if they hear no and they feel rejection, Mm -hmm. it's typically that they, they align sex with love, right? They feel like sex makes them feel loved. And if they're not getting sex, that means they're not loved. And that's a really bad story to tell yourself because it's a false story. And that false story then can cause hurt feelings and cause lots of pain and can cause disconnection and resentment within the relationship. So if one partner's thinking that when the other partner says no, that means that they don't really care about them. They they're not loved. They don't, and they're not feeling loved right? That can cause havoc in a relationship. Mm, Yeah. Well, and to be on the other side of that, if I reject them, yeah, if they're going to take it personally or, or 
turn this into you don't love me, then the obligation piece might come in to be like, well, I have to do this in order for you to feel loved. Exactly. Then, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So understanding what sex means to you and really having an honest conversation about that and challenging your belief systems can really help couples when they have a desire discrepancy. Mm. One of yeah. the best things as we are in our middle years and older that we can do with our partner is to really develop the friend, like continue to develop our friendship, spend yeah. time together, just respect one another as friends and enjoy one another's company. Yeah. Right. Like that's one crucial ingredient that is helpful for couples. Mm -hmm. And the other is to prioritize sex, whatever it looks like for you to prioritize it. Right. Mm. So that you're not into a situation where, well, we haven't had sex in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks before we know it. It's been two months. It's been three months since we've had sex. And then it's even harder to get back to that place of being sexual again. Mm, yeah. So really like, I mean, do you ever encourage, I guess it depends on the couple, like having it like a scheduled time or, or <laughs> just to have it. I mean, I know that sounds a little awkward and weird, but, but too, if for people who want to know what's expected, like me, uh -huh. <laughs> to sort of have a plan about how it's going to unfold. No, I do not think it sounds funny at all. And that's <laughs> what my my husband and I do. <laughs> we schedule sex because yeah. it helps me to know to be able to plan, right? Yeah. And then yeah. if I'm not in the mood for sex that day, I can do what I need to do to get myself in the mood. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it's important and we've planned it. And mm. when you start canceling out on your partner, to have sex, that is not, that can be a very unhealthy thing. It's one thing to say, you know, I know we were going to have sex today, but I don't, I just, I'm so overwhelmed with things. I'm stressed. I can't relax. How about tomorrow? Right? Like yeah. that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you keep putting it off and putting it off or every time you say, oh, I'm too stressed now, let's do it tomorrow. Then, then that is really not a good idea. Yeah. That makes For sense. some people, if they schedule sex, it puts more pressure on them. They, sure. they feel anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. So for those that. people, maybe scheduling sex is, is not a good idea. But I will say, as we get older, really, we kind of need to schedule sex more and more because either one person has to take erectile dysfunction medication, okay, right. and sometimes you got to wait a period of time before mm -hmm. you can be sexual mm -hmm. or where you're working around jobs or other things. And yeah. so I think scheduling sex is great. Yeah. I've actually had people say, but then it's not spontaneous. So it's really not sex. And I'm like, when you go to a restaurant and you order food, didn't you plan that out? That's not <laughs> spontaneous, right? Is that food still good? Right. Are you still eating and enjoying it? Of yes. course you are. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. But I, I guess, yes, for some people, it feels like it has to be more organic than planned. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I see the value in planning because as an older adult, it's easy to, to sort of put the tasks ahead of sex life, right? Oh, I got to do oh, the laundry. Yes. We got to go grocery shop, whatever it is. I got to work. Yeah take the dog to the vet, whatever it might be. It's easy to have those things get in the way of mm -hmm. that intimacy and, and setting aside that time just for each other. Exactly. Because those things are always going to be there. You're, yeah. I mean, we're never really caught up with the dishes or the laundry, right? Because the minute never. you think you are, oh, we're not. Yep. yep. Right. Yep. So yep. those things will always be there. Yeah. Yeah. But our partners might not. Yeah. Or our ability to be sexual with our partners might not. Mm. Yes. You know, I, yes. I've been pretty yes. out there that my husband has erectile dysfunction and we've had to work through this together as a couple, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons I became an expert in erectile dysfunction, because I, I wanted to know more about this just for my own situation. 
Sure. And kind of, we were kind of joking around this last week. And, and we both said, gosh, if only we'd known we would have had a heck of a lot more sex like 10 years ago, 20 years ago <laughs> than we did. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Right. You don't know, yeah. you don't know what the future holds. That is true. Right. And it's, it's true of everything really. Right. But, but it's yeah. definitely true of our sex lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the fact that it doesn't get talked about in our younger years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not normalized as part of aging. And all you see is the commercials for erectile dysfunction drugs that like, this is going to fix it. And suddenly oh. you're both going to be like in the mood and have this amazing sex life. But that's not the truth either. No, it's, <laughs> uh, I could go on a big rant about this and, and I'll spare you that. But, you know, <laughs> taking a pill... It doesn't fix it for everybody. So then when they see this advertising and it doesn't work for them, then it reinforces, oh my gosh, something's really wrong with me. Like, totally. I, I'm, I I'm not imagine. good enough. And the other thing is that magic pill is not going to suddenly make a person a better lover. It's not going to make them more attentive. It's not going to make them better at foreplay. It's not going to make them more sensitive to their partner's needs sexually. It's just going to give them an erection and give them a harder erection for longer. So, <laughs> oh goodness, it's really yes, not yes, the panacea. Yes. It's sold. It's sold to be. No, 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 it is not. Well, Heather, <laughs> this has been a wonderful conversation, and I love that we can talk about sex and a good sex life in an open and honest way. The problems and the benefits of it. But uh, how do people find you if they want to know more about you and your podcast and all of that? Oh, thank you for asking. My website is lovefilledlife.com. So that's lovefilledlife.com. And my podcast is The Great Sex Podcast. And you can find that through the website or you can just go to Apple or Spotify and search for, for Great Sex Podcasts and it'll pop up. Nice. And I love that all the episodes, at least some of the episodes that I've listened to are very short and direct and right to the point. And it's really awesome. So thank you. Hope, that was, uh, that was definitely something that was important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I hope that the listeners will check it out. So thanks so much for being a guest today. And I look forward to talking to you in our future conversations. Thanks so much, Biz. I appreciate it. So starting last season and continuing on into this season, I have asked my guests for a piece of wisdom that they feel is important to share with all of you listeners. And in my conversation with Heather, I just forgot to ask her. I didn't remember that that was a piece I wanted to include. So I emailed her quickly and said, can you just send me a quick brief uh, audio file for all of you so you could hear her wisdom. And thankfully, she did that for us. So here is Heather England's words of wisdom for all of us. A tip I would give any couple that wants to strengthen their relationship or improve their sexual intimacy would be to focus on building your friendship become better friends. So do all those things that you would need to do to nurture a really close and connected friendship between the two of you. Because the more you have mutual respect for one another, enjoy doing things together and enjoy being together, the more your relationship is going to grow, the stronger it's going to be, and the more likely you are to want to have sex with your partner. So that's the tip I would give to any couple. And all the research shows that couples that nurture their friendship throughout their relationship have really long lasting, close sexual intimacy with one another. A beautiful insight that I hope lands for you in your world if you need it. 
Oh, I really appreciated uh, Heather coming on the podcast and just exploring the struggles that sex in midlife can bring. But I think in general into relationships, how much sex can be a stumbling block to true intimacy and that in order for us to feel really connected with our partners, it needs to be something that we talk about. And I feel like we're just not given a model for that. Or I will say I was not given a model for how to do that, how to talk about sex, how to talk to a partner about what you want, what you don't want. So I just really, truly appreciated Heather's openness and honesty and directness around sex and what we can do to help increase intimacy in our relationships in midlife. So I hope you'll check out Heather's information and check out her website and her podcast, Great Sex. So if you want to be in the loop, if you want to know when new episodes of the podcast are released, if you want to know when I am have special offers in the coaching world and you want to know about how to work with me, sign up for my newsletter. It's the best way to get the information about the podcast, about working with me, about the blogs that I write and share. You can also submit a question if you're a subscriber and I will explore that either on the podcast or in my blog. Pretty great stuff. So just go to elizabethcushcoaching.com forward slash sign up and you will get on the list and you will be a part of my email list where you'll get all the goods, get all the information and be in the loop. So I hope you'll sign up there and I look forward to connecting with you all right here on the podcast next time. Thanks for listening to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music by Andy Cush, sound editing by Laura Disler, and show notes by Kathy Cush. If you'd like more information about me, Biz Cush, and the resources shared today, go to awakenyourwisewoman.com.